Well, water is certainly the most precious commodity that there is, and yet most of us don't think of it as such. Its availability in seemingly unlimited quantities has made water actually lose its value. But by almost all accounts, the age of water abundance is coming to an end. I sat down with economist David Zetlin, the author of The End of Abundance, to learn why he believes many of the crises we may soon face could be solved with some simple economics. Well, David, with the world's population sitting at 7 billion on its way to 9.5 billion by 2050, many say the conventional wisdom is that we are looking down the barrel of a global water crisis. But I've read that you may not feel that way. Yeah, we're, we're looking down the, that barrel if we don't change what we're doing. We're talking about the food and water together. Uh, something that people leave off all the time, which is really important, is that a lot of agriculture around the world is actually rain-fed, it's not irrigated. So most of the water crisis problems tend to be around irrigated water, which is super important because we get a lot more yield when we irrigate the land. So there's food policies around the world, there's food trade around the world. It's uh, affected in many ways by these, these politics. And uh, the water that goes into the food system, the growing system, is uh, sometimes wasted. Some of the food is wasted. Sometimes we grow the wrong crops. So if we continue to do what we're doing in terms of those old habits, if we continue to keep policies the way they are in terms of grow this, don't sell it to that person, then we're going to have a bigger problem. Uh, and we is actually not Americans. We is the poorer people in the world because uh, money is still going to talk and people are still going to be able to afford food. But uh, people who are malnourished today will be even worse off in the future if we don't change the way we manage those things. Now, as an economist, you say if we apply simple economics, that dismal science to water, mm -hmm. that in fact the s solutions may not be as draconian as some predict. Right. Yeah, that's um, because when I say apply economics, what I mean is allowing people to work with each other in a a win-win basis. So a market is usually a win-win. You go into the store, you give them some money, they give you some food, both sides are happy. Politics tends to be a, a zero-sum game. Somebody wins and somebody loses. You go into the store, you take all their money, and then you run out. You know, it's a theft in a sense. So in the water sector, whether it's urban water or it's uh, uh, agricultural water or it's water that's used for other purposes like uh, uh, energy, there is a huge political and regulatory involvement, and sometimes that involvement and the policies there, they lag where people are going. They don't reflect water scarcity. And what you end up getting is, is people come up to a cliff, and then suddenly they realize there's a shortage and they fall off the cliff. And in, the, in other sectors that are run in a more market-friendly way, then uh, prices allow people to adjust what they're doing. So uh, the oil and gas sector, uh, the price of gasoline will go up, people will drive less. The price of oil goes up, people will drill more wells. So, uh, or the gas station is running low on gas, they bring in another tanker of gas. So in those sectors, we're not used to shortages, we're not used to these uh, problems that we see in the water sector, and we can use economics in some areas of water. We can't necessarily, you know, it's not a free market kind of anywhere because uh, water tends to be distributed by a monopoly, whether it's your city water utility or it's an irrigation district. But we can allow price signals and people making deals to replace a lot of the command and control or, uh, mechan mechanism that's in place right now. Well, roughly 70% of human directed use of water goes towards agriculture. Mm -hmm. Now in Israel, they use virtually all of their wastewater for irrigation on their crops. Mm -hmm. Here in the U.S., we use very little. Mm -hmm. Should we follow the Israeli model or could we even follow the Israeli model? So the funny thing is, is that a lot of farmers end up using wastewater from other farmers because the water flows from one farmer down the river or down the canal to another farmer or it goes underground and the farmer pumps it up again, a different farmer pumps it up. A lot of times a city will discharge its wastewater into a river and another city will take it in and use it for drinking water. So we have been recycling water informally on a large scale in the U.S. and around the world for a long time. Uh, Israel's system of, of directing wastewater into irrigation is based on having a fairly compact area and directing literally a pipe of wastewater to a particular settling area that goes in and then they pump it out again. So it's an engineered kind of system uh, and, the natural sy and, and it represents the natural system that we use in the U.S. In some parts of the U.S. this also happens. There is wastewater that comes straight out of a treatment plant and onto the field.
That practice of directing uh, treated wastewater uh, onto uh, uh, irrigation or even back into our drinking water systems is going to increase because water is increasingly scarce and because the regulations and the technology for cleaning water are increasingly strict. So what you have is kind of an uh, a increasing quality of water and an increasing need for water and those are going to meet to the point where people say, I don't call that wastewater, that's previously owned water. I'm going to buy that from you and use it for economic value and it's, and it's going to be clean enough to use for all standards. So it sounds as if we possibly should change our approach towards water, mm -hmm. but also that technology may turn out to be our best friend when it comes to water. Right. The policy should allow the technology to fill it in, right? So you can have a technology and the, and the laws or the regulations prevent you from doing that. Uh, on the other hand, you can't make a regulation or, and, and assume the technology will show up. But those things can work hand in hand. And, and one of these examples is uh, uh, gray water use, which means taking the water out of your kitchen sink or out of your shower even and putting that outside to water your flowers or your lawn. People have been using gray water for thousands of years. And yet, we got out of that habit when we had this awesome water coming out of our faucets that was actually very, very clean, and we put that on the lawn instead. And now the regulations say you can't put water from your shower onto your lawn because it's a human health hazard. Well, this is a bit strong, I think. And so in that case, you have a regulation which is stopping a traditional practice from occurring. And those kinds of regulations are in the way. Now, I've read that you can boil down your water policy into basically a bumper uh, sticker size slogan. And what, what is it? Some water for free? Mm -hmm. Pay for more? If you want to recognize some water for free, that's okay, but not all water for free. So, you know, the, most people, they, for their personal use, they're only going to use, you know, five or ten gallons a day. If they take a long shower, they might use 20 gallons a day. Let's call that free. But then you have to pay for the rest of the water, whether it's going to be water that you put in your, in your clothes washing machine or on your, on your driveway or on your lawn, uh, and then you should pay for it because, in the end, every water system has to recover its costs. And if you give away water for free too much, then you have a water system that's broke and they won't spend money to give you healthy water and then you'll be regretting it.